Hello, good afternoon. I'm going to introduce today's film and then we will watch three segments from the film. As I've done in the past, I'm going to ask you to leave your comments, your observations, your reactions in the Google Docs file. You can do it later if you don't want to spoil the experience of watching the movie. You don't have to comment on every single scene or detail. Even a general commentary would be acceptable. Uh, just leave it before the end of the week. We're talking about Steve McQueen's Le Mans from 1971. In 1970, when the film was shot, produced, Steve McQueen was one of the highest paid actors in Hollywood on his way to becoming the highest paid actor in the early 70s, just a few years later. He was 40 or so, had uh, starred in a series of very successful movies during the 1960s. In some of them, he was the protagonist. Bullet, for example, from 1968, where he was uh, participated in one of the uh, best, uh, most celebrated car chases in the history of cinema, the Thomas Crown Affair, and also a series of very successful ensemble movies alongside many other American and British actors. For example, The Great Escape, which I watched in theaters as a kid with my family. And like many other actors before him, he was also in love with cars and with racing, car racing, motorcycles, motorbike racing as well. So he had this idea that he would make the ultimate film about car racing. And this would be very much his own work of love. In order to do this, he prepared for a long time. For example, in March of 1970, so three or four months before the movie went into shooting, he participated in a famous international race, the 12 Hours of Sebring, which was an endurance race, a um, category of racing that was very popular during that time and saw the participation of some of the most famous champions of the period. For example, Mario Andretti was there. So Steve acquired a very expensive and, and cutting edge uh, race car, a Porsche 908, a two-seater, even though uh, just the driver would be there. It was just tradition that there would be a second seat. And uh, since it was a 12 hours race, of course, no one could um, participate in, in the race by uh, themselves. He also, of course, had a professional driver uh, with him, Peter Revson. It just so happened that uh, Steve McQueen, being a daredevil, trying to be the king of cool, as he was defined by the media of the time, had an accident while motor racing and uh, came to the race in Sebring, the day of the race, with a cast on his left foot. He participated in the race nonetheless, even though the co-pilot, the, the other driver, Peter Revson, was forced to drive most of the time, which was also best for them because uh, Revson was two to three seconds faster per lap than Steve McQueen. Of course, even being two to three seconds slower than a professional driver was an accomplishment by, by Steve. At the end of race, Steve McQueen was 
the leading car, in the leading car. Uh, the the co-driver the, the co drove well. Uh, there, were, there were a series of retirements. Uh, the Ferrari, the Porsche in first and second position retired. It seemed like they were uh, doing this incredible feat by winning the race. Something happened that you will then see incorporated in the plot of the film that day. That is to say, Mario Andretti, who was driving one of the Ferraris, and who was eager to leave uh, because the next day he had another race, a Formula Indy race. Um, his car uh, had mechanical issues, was not doing well. And the team manager of Ferrari told him to get on another car so that he, with his skills, could make up the, the, the gap they had with the leading Porsche, the Porsche of Steve McQueen and Peter Revson, and win the race. And this is what Mario Andretti did. Got on another car, it was allowed by the rules at that time, and put in incredible laps, one after another, and slowly caught up with the Porsche, and Steve McQueen ended up just being second, finished second at Sebring, which was already uh, a, a great thing, a great victory of sorts. This same car that Steve McQueen had purchased was modified between March and June so that the car could enter the 24 hour of Le Mans in 1970, in June of 1970, and the car was rigged with cameras in the front and the back so that the camera could race with the other cars and take footage of the race from the level of a driver and from, from in, within the very same environment. This makes, among other things, the film unique in its, in its efforts to reproduce the real feeling of speed. The car was allowed by the organization of the race of the 24 Hour of Le Mans to participate, but as a guest car of sorts. That is to say, the, the agreement was that the car would not be classified at the end, and therefore this allowed more freedom to Steve McQueen and his crew. They could, when, whenever the car stopped, replace the film, they showed an incredible amount and, and spent an incredible amount of money on film. They, they had tens of thousands of meters of film at the end from the eight or 10 hours that the car was actually on the track. There were long breaks. Okay. So after the race was over, Steve McQueen in July, end of June, beginning of July, moved his crew to France, established what was called the Solar Village from the name of the production company that Steve McQueen put together. Steve McQueen was putting in his own money to finance most of the film. And between July and September, they remained at the racetrack in Le Mans with cars, actual race cars, they got, they, they leased or uh, received on loan from Porsche. They asked Porsche and Ferrari uh, to uh, loan them their actual race cars. Ferrari refused, they were famously difficult with giving permission for these kinds of movies. They were worried they would, would they be portrayed well enough. And Enzo Ferrari was also kind of stingy, he was afraid that he would be cheated financially. Porsche agreed to give some cars, and you find there are some of the official cars. And then they went to private teams or privateers, drivers who uh, participated in races of this kind with their own cars, uh, to uh, get them to give them their cars. They even hired some 
professional drivers, including, for example, Joe Seifert, who was, among other things, a Formula One driver and who would die the next year in an accident where his car burned down and he suffocated um, uh, before uh, he could be taken out of the burning cars. The sport was very dangerous during that time. Every year in racing, there were multiple deaths across various categories, especially in Formula One and the endurance category, which is the category for the 24 hour of Le Mans. Uh, and when shooting, while shooting the movie, Steve McQueen insisted on a degree of realism that has become impossible because these days, if you want to shoot even just a car chase, uh, the insurance company that covers the film will prevent you from having actual actors driving at high speed. And so you end up with these pitiful scenes these days. They're either digitally produced or you, you, you end up with these pitiful segments in current movies where a sleuth of cars are driving 30 miles per hour and someone is driving 60. And, and you can see that uh, there is no actual feeling of speed. No, Steve McQueen was using real race, car, uh, race cars and driving at 150 miles per hour, if not more than that. During that time, the cars on the main street of Le Mans, which, is very, which was very long and uninterrupted, later on they put in two bands in order to limit the speed, but at that time, the top cars at Le Mans would reach speeds of 370, 380 kilometers per hour, which is about 240 miles per hour. And so they wouldn't reach exactly those speeds, but really had uh, uh, realistic uh, levels of speed, so much so that, for example, at some point they, they had an accident and one of the drivers, who was a gentleman driver, an amateur driver, participating in real races, lost part of his leg. And if you see the documentary that was produced and published in, uh, circulated in 2015 about the, the race, how the, about the film, how the, the film was shot, uh, David Piper is there on a wheelchair talking about the film uh, and what happened. The real problem, so, Steve McQueen wanted to achieve this degree of realism, so he would wait for the right light because he wanted to reproduce the race through the 24 hours, right? So depending on where you are in the movie, you need sunset, you need dusk, you need dawn, right? So you cannot just shoot or apply filters as it was done uh, uh, during the 1960s and 70s where they would have filters, they would shoot night scene during the day, just applying dark filters to the camera. Not, none of that was, was good enough for Steve McQueen. Uh, he would uh, have the racetrack flooded for certain scenes because during the 24 hours of Le Mans, you often have in June rain at least part of the time. More importantly, though, Steve started shooting without a finished script. He brought with him the screenplay writers and they would submit scripts or uh, ideas for scenes and he would on the set read them and, and tear them apart, told them to rewrite and go on shooting things uh, that belong to the atmosphere, to the vibe of the race without a, an overarching story. It was not really such a big deal to him because he was looking for the approach that we found also in, uh, in, in, in Traffic, for example, and, and more famous films of the period, the so-called Nouvelle, the Nouvelle Vague, uh, 
uh, that inspired so many French and European and American directors was the idea of telling a story with images. Making a film about the images and not the story itself. So the purpose of the film should not have been, according to this uh, uh, interpretation of what cinema is about, should not have been to make a fictional story that you normally find on paper into the film. The film is a different medium, so even the story has to be done through images and doesn't really have to follow the same arc, beginning, middle, end that you would find in a traditional literary story. By the end of September, Steve McQueen had run out of money Seven and a half million dollars were spent on this film, which was a fabulous amount at that time. And in order to secure funding to finish the film, he had to give up his, his rights to the film. He has to uh, uh, renounce to the salary that uh, he should have received as an actor, which was supposed to be something like half a million or $750,000, so a good amount and had to give up on any rights, future rights, on the sale of the film. He agreed to that because he wanted the film to be finished. The producer brought in an exper a young uh, director, uh, but uh, someone, uh, Katz, who was experienced with uh, TV series, so a, a doer, someone who uh, could do a lot of things even with a small budget, and the film was finished, distributed, did not enjoy the success, the immediate success Steve McQueen expected. However, it enjoyed a long lasting success because it was clear to the aficionados of automobiles and car racing that this film really managed to encapsulate the feeling of speed, the relationship between the man and the machine in ways that no one before or after could do, with very few exceptions. In the film, you find two semi-quasi-protagonists, but really the film is about racing and is about this idea that a race car is the combination of the driver and the machine. And this combination is so particular that the people involved with it, the drivers themselves, the mechanics, the members of the team, the spectators are all part of an almost mystical experience. Therefore, at the beginning of the, of the film, which is almost like a documentary, because part of the film was shot during the race in June 1970, you simply see the dawn from, from the early morning of the race, uh, because the race starts in the afternoon and ends in the afternoon. It starts at 3 or 4 p.m. in France. I think it's 4 p.m. Uh, so it goes on through the night, and the end is the 4 p.m. the next day. Um, you see simply the preparations that are being made at the racetrack before the race, including the cops, uh, the staff. You see the people going to Le Mans for the race. At that time, you had more than 300,000 people attending the event through the weekend. A lot of them would spend the night there. And, and there is a hotel which is uh, still there and, and very expensive, so a lot of people would just bring tents and, or, or sleeping bags and, and uh, spend the time there. And there are a few other things that you can do at the racetrack. They have an amusement park, for example, uh, and, and they have restaurants, of course, and, and food kiosks, etc. Uh, so you don't really have to sit for 24 hours watching the, the cars uh, go by. Um, so, for a, for a long stretch of the film, which we will skip today, you just see 
the ritual of the race. And from that you gather a sense of importance without really lines of dialogue being spoken. While the race is being prepared, of course, Steve McQueen, who's Michael Delaney, a driver, is going to the racetrack with his own car. And while he does that, two things happen that are visual representations of the story without the support of any lines. While driving to the racetrack, he drives by a woman who's buying flowers. And then he stops on the racetrack itself. And we see that the guardrail on one side of the track is new for a short stretch. And Steve McQueen is looking at this. This is exactly when this happens. And you have this shots, this is a series of frames representing every camera angle. You see the new guardrail, and from there, without a single line or a voiceover, you focus on that, and then you have a flashback. It's night, 1969, that 1969 race, where Steve McQueen, as Michael Delaney, was participating, and during the night, you see just the lights of the cars. The cars are still driving 200 miles on the streets of Le Mans in the night. Of course, the drivers know the track very well, and they had signs, right? The 100 sign means 100 meters from the next turn, right? Which uh, drivers use as uh, um, points of reference to know where to brake, depending on their car. Right? Some cars will be able to brake just 50 meters before a turn. Other cars will have to start braking earlier because these cars, these races have different categories. And one of the difficulties in driving at Le Mans or in endurance races is that you have much slower cars and very fast cars driving together on the same track. Okay, so you can imagine on this very long straight, you may have uh, cars driving at just 120 to 150 miles, and other cars driving 200 to 240 uh, um, miles per hour. And you just see elements, bits and pieces, right? Uh, as you see how the scene is built, and then you have an accident and fire. Uh, it's the Ferrari of Piero Belgetti, and you see his name, and this is enough to tell the story and to carry the story. And Michael was also involved in the accident, right? And now in this flashback, you see the woman who was buying flowers and you understand that this is Belgetti's wife or companion who is at the pits. It's very hard to, to see. Uh, let, let me, okay, sorry. Now, now you can see her. She's in the pit lane, right, waiting for Piero to come by, and there is a sound, an alarm, that signals that an accident has happened, and then the PA system of the, of the racetrack informs that there was an accident involving Piero Belgetti and uh, Michael Delani. So you know that she's been buying flowers because she wants to bring those flowers to the place of the accident, that she's now a widow. And, and you see her face and her going through emotions, which is typical of French films from the 1960s that inspired uh, Steve McQueen when he uh, thought of the scene. And you see from the crushed helmet that this was little, and then you see Steve McQueen as Michael Delaney being carried away. So, you know, he survived, he was involved, and in a way he was also traumatized, right? He went back. So he feels something about the accident that is unresolved. Was he responsible? The film doesn't say, because a lot in this film is simply suggested. Same with the relationship between Lisa 
and Michael. So they see each other at Le Mans a year later. They bump into each other because Lisa is still there uh, in, in the pit lane or in the vicinity watching the race. And there is some tension. But the tension is dual. On one side, you have the unresolved feeling of the accident. Was Michael responsible? Or the very fact that Michael was in that accident is brings up strong memories, painful memories in Lisa. The other side of the tension is, could a love story develop between Lisa and Michael? And by the end of the movie, this becomes more of a reality, but it remains a tension. It remains a game played not with lines. There is no big love declaration. There, are, there is no suggestion that the relationship might develop. It's all about body language. It's all about their faces. It all, it's all about their eyes. As far as this storyline at the end of the film, Michael, who finishes the race on somebody else's car after his car is wrecked in the morning. So after uh, the, the, the afternoon, evening and the night, Michael is not the winner, although his actions on the track helped the Porsche team have a winning car up ahead. And while the people are flooding the area of the pit lanes to celebrate the victory of Porsche and, and the victorious driver, in the middle of the crowd, Michael will look for Lisa. And Lisa will look for Michael, they're distant, and they will just look at each other. And that'll be it. We don't know what's going to happen to them. As far as the rest of the film, the way the race develops, is that, as I said before, there is a battle between the Porsches and the Ferraris. There are accidents, as it used to happen. One of them is a very serious accident with a car that flies in the air. And uh, the, the driver is seriously wounded. And Michael drives by the place where the accident took place. And this creates an impression on him, right? To see, once again, an accident that could be a lethal uh, accident brings back memories and, and he loses his focus and concentration. And right after he has driven through the scene of the accident, he finds a slower car and he cannot avoid the slower car in time, ends up wrecking his car. He's taken to the infirmary. He's not, uh, he's okay though. He's, he's, he has several scratches and bruises, but he's okay. And then later, the team manager of Porsche says, I want you to take somebody else's seat on a car. He takes another driver's seat in order to help uh, secure a victory for another Porsche car by blocking a Ferrari. He will prevent a faster Ferrari from reaching the leading Porsche and passing it. He's blocking up until the last lap. And a little bit. It's an anti-hero. It's not even the winner of the race. And this is very unusual because every single movie Hollywood has made about driving in races it's all about the drama. It's all about the drivers, the race drivers being superheroes. Superheroes because of course they are facing death because they have these incredible skills. They can drive at these very high speeds. Here, instead, everything is subdued. It's about unusual people, these race car drivers like Michael, Steve McQueen, whose life is very boring, very dull, very flat, until they enter the car. But even after they enter the car, it's all about the symbiotic relationship and interaction between the driver and the machine. It's not about the driver as a new gladiator, as a brave hero, uh, challenging others in an event where people can die. 
it's rather about a mystical experience. It's about finding peace. It's about finding fulfillment while behind the steering wheel of a car that is driving at more than 200 miles per hour. So it's a very unique treatment of the theme of the relationship with the automobile. And that's the reason why we have included uh, this film in uh, the, the class. So the first series of scenes is from the moment before the start of the race. So you will see Michael get to the pit lane to enter the car. Keep in mind that during that period and for many years after that, Le Mans was unique as a race also because of the start procedure. Instead of having the cars on the straight and then a flag giving the start, the cars are on one side where the pits are, the drivers are on the other side. And when a signal is given, the drivers run to their cars, enter, put on their belts, and then turn on the engine, and then they leave. And it's kind of a chaotic um, uh, situation. And we will see uh, the, the first lap of the race, which takes as long as the real time lap in the film, and then until the time when, since these cars have a team of drivers, a group of drivers, when uh, Michael finishes his own stint, his first stint at the car, and leaves the pit lane to go to uh, his RV uh, to uh, rest, to take a break, right? Because the, the, the drivers in between stints rest, eat, drink, stretch, relax, uh, etc. Okay, so that is the first portion of the movie we are going to watch. Let me find exactly where to start. It's 1820. 